my name is Pete Schmidt. I'm a software developer at Maxar, um, and I am going to talk about some accuracy challenges that might be unique to Maxar and due to the way we design and build our satellites. And I think um, uh, reading up on the spring school, I think there's probably uh, students in this session who know way more about this topic than me. Um, and I have some, you know, pretty graphics and uh, to go over and, and kind of demonstrate, you know, from, a, from my role as a software developer, like, you know, what, what do I see when looking at imagery and some of these challenges? So the contents of my talk are to talk about a little bit of review of Maxar satellites, how we collect imagery and um, some applications, and then go into some sources of error that uh, can degrade our accuracy and uh, solutions to improve that. And then again, I'll finish with a couple more applications. Um, and some of this is review from what Fabio said uh, just before me. Uh, uh, for instance, this is the Maxar constellation of um, Earth observing satellites. Uh, we have four currently four satellites currently in orbit, uh, collecting uh, uh, imagery, and we have this Worldview Legion is our next program. It's going to be launched with six additional satellites. Um, and what's interesting about that constellation is that we have a, a huge archive of imagery spanning over 20 years um, and a hundred petabyte archive and growing. And uh, I, I have a picture of a semi truck here <laughs> in my slides, might seem weird. And when Maxar, Maxar which is formerly Digital Globe, uh, was started, all the imagery would be downlinked to a ground station and transferred to our data center where we had this giant tape archive that was owned and managed by um, Maxar. And uh, when we wanted to uh, expand our data center, we would run into challenges. You know, it's, it's hard, to, hard to just grow your computing capacity uh, when you're hosting uh, your software and hardware like on premises. And so we wound up porting everything over to a cloud provider, uh, Amazon. And with our, our archive, uh, it's hard to move 100 petabytes of data, even if you have a really fast internet connection. And so Amazon launched this service called uh, AWS Snowmobile. And the idea is you drive this semi truck, it's full of hard drives. And they parked it outside of our office uh, for a couple of weeks. And we um, transferred the whole archive to the semi truck. They drove it to an Amazon data center. Um, all, all, all that Maxar had to do was plug in a couple of wires uh, from this semi truck uh, to provide power and network connectivity. And then they drove the truck back to the Amazon data center and made our data available in the cloud. Um, just a, a you know example from like, not that many satellites uh, turns into a huge data explosion problem um, and kind of a creative solution to get the data transferred in a reasonable length of time is uh, just drive the data over physically. But now it's all in the cloud and as new, new collects, a new imagery collects happen, that data stream directly to our cloud provider. Um, and so, that's a little bit about our constellation and, and the data we have, but let's look at some visuals of this data. Uh, here's one example col image collect um, from our Worldview 2 sensor. Um, this image covers about 200 square kilometers on the ground. Um, and all of our uh, uh, satellites have uh, the sensor on it, it's a push broom sensor. And that um, this is what I, I like what Fabio said earlier that not all images are created equal. And I have some examples of that um, and, and some challenges that it provides. So, you know, here's a one collect that's 200 square kilometers. But like I said, our, our, um, 
sensors are these push broom sensors. And uh, basically as the satellite flies in the sun synchronous orbit, it's scanning the ground um, with a linear array of sensors uh, with photon detectors. And it, as it's scanning over, um, you can figure out the position of the satellite and um, you know, like the precise timing information about where you're pointed on the ground and, and when those pixels are collected. And so we are able to convert these, these like 1D array of, of um, photon detectors, we were able to convert it into a 2D image. Um, when, when I started at Maxar, I, my background is not remote sensing, it's uh, high performance computing. And this was not intuitive to me at the time. You know, I, I know the, the camera on my phone is just a, a 2D array of sensors. You know, you point, point the camera on your phone someplace, take a picture and you have a 2D image, but that's not the way our uh, satellites work. And um, the reason they're this way uh, as a push broom sensor is it gives us a lot more flexibility when imaging uh, because as a satellite flies over, um, we can just, you know, effectively open the, uh, the shutter for longer periods of time. And then you can collect really big images just by having the, um, having the, like I said, having the aperture open for longer as you take a, a collect. And so this, here's a, uh, which satellite is this? Different satellite, but um, we could take, you know, 200 square kilometer images, or as this example shows, a 6,200 kilometer uh, image. And um, the reason our satellites are built this way is just, a, you know, a series of engineering trade-offs to launch the, you know, cheapest satellite you can to achieve um, the, you know, most cost-effective way of collecting imagery. Uh, and so these are all engineering trade-offs that like the like satellite manufacturing uh, step. And that carries, you know, that causes interesting challenges then when like my, my background is like, I work with the, the data once it's all collected and in that giant archive and I have to comb through the archive and maybe deal with um, challenges uh, just by the way our satellites are built. And so one example is, you know, that from the perspective of the satellite, our image is, is a, looks like a rectangle, right? So it's, you know, the, the number of photon detectors um, as, as columns of this like linear array, but then the scan time of how long is it, are we collecting imagery? Um, so yeah, you, you know, you can figure out how many megapixels or whatever your image is uh, the number of pixels uh, in that single image. But a lot of the times we're working with projected images um, onto the earth. And in this case, the uh, amount of memory required to load an image into, into memory is actually when you're dealing with the uh, ortho, uh, ortho photo uh, on some projection, you can actually require many more pixels, um, a lot more memory to to store at one time and if you ever if you had a image processing step that needed like a global operation uh well then you're going to need a computer with a lot of memory to load an image like that and so that's just and this is you know one artifact of like because we're using a push broom sensor we can take these big collects but then they introduce challenges um when you're working on the imagery later here's Another example um, where we can have really big collects, this is a single satellite collect of the entire uh, country of Qatar. And so when, you know, the first image I showed was 200 square kilometers. This image, uh, the surface area of Earth it covers is 26,000 square kilometers. And um, while it's not a diagonal collect, like I showed before, it's still, that's a lot of data. Um, and again, it's an artifact of like that. Uh, I'm going to touch back on what, like why, why does this image cover such a huge uh, footprint, like 26,000 square kilometers, whereas the previous image I was showing also a huge area, but only 6,000 square kilometers. So I'm going to come back to why 
this image covers such a big area of Earth. And so how do we deal with these large collects if you're doing, you know, big, big scale computing? Uh, well, we like to tile, I, <laughs> I like to tile out my images. So here on the right, I'm showing, you know, a single collect. Uh, and then if I subdivide that collect, oops, into a grid of tiles, and maybe I can do my data processing on those independent tiles and, you know, have a, allow a smaller, have a smaller memory footprint. And when you're thinking about running in a cloud provider, you know, cloud providers like Amazon, they provide very uh, uh, exotic machines. So you can get a machine with like, I think terabytes of memory, but then you're going to pay for it. It's expensive. And it's a lot cheaper to run, well, it can be cheaper to run on a lot of smaller, cheaper instances, and then try to do parallel processing where you're, you know, independently processing many small tiles on many small instances, and you can save a lot of money when you're working with a lot of data. And so, yeah, the, the Maxar analysis ready data product. Uh, defines imagery on the, the these fixed grids that are five kilometer tiles. Uh, it's these grids are all aligned to uh, this military grid reference system or MGRS, which is a ten kilometer uh, global grid um, split into different UTM zones. And uh, I'm going to come back to this concept of these five kilometer tiles and this this fixed grid later in the talk. But um, okay, so we reviewed the constellation and some of the uh, details about our collection capabilities. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about mosaics. Um, and a mosaic is a uh, mashup of a bunch of different collects. Um, and here I'm showing one mosaic, and you might think, gosh, that looks, you can really see the different collect collection geometries. Um, and each collect looks pretty different here. And the way we build our mosaics uh, is we actually start with loading these different images um, using what we call our like browse imagery. So we have like our whole archive, it's available at, at uh, 16 meter uh, browse images. And these browse images, they're all, um, the colors are all adjusted independently of one another. Um, and you know, these different different images could be collected at different seasons uh, under different atmospheric conditions. Uh, maybe there's more water vapor present uh, one day versus another, you know, maybe it's foggy or uh, there's a lot of clouds or um, high cirrus, thin cirrus clouds. And that can really throw off this, uh, our dynamic range adjustment when you're trying to make, you know, one image look uh, clear across the whole image. Um, that then comparing it against different images collected at different seasons with different, you know, leaf on, leaf off conditions. Uh, and so we wrote an automated process that uh, runs in the cloud that reads in this imagery and then forms um, these cut lines. And then this automated process stitches everything together uh, as if it looks like a single collect, you know, somebody was flying in space and took like one image of a continent. Um, but really, those these mosaics are stitched up of, you know, tens, hundreds or thousands of images, all, all with these different collection aspects. And our automated process like generates um, seam lines on like a per pixel basis, uh, and then routes those seam lines, so that it looks as if a, it was a single image. And a lot of work on into this. I, I, I spent, I don't know, my first seven years working at Maxar just on this process of taking, you know, a bunch of dis disparate satellite collects and determining these cut lines and merging them into a seamless mosaic. And I say seamless, but then sometimes if you zoom in, uh, and look at a mosaic at like a one-to-one -one resolution where one pixel on your monitor is one pixel in the image. Sometimes you'll notice these discontinuities 
And you might think, um, well, that doesn't look right unless there was a, you know, that's a fa active fault line and there was an earthquake. <laughs> um, but really, if I draw the mosaic cut line here, you'll see that this is this cut line is um, a blend region between two different images. And um, so a lot of times I will get called into meetings where, you know, somebody pulls up a mosaic, says, like, hey, what's going on here? Why, you know, why is there this big cut line? And then um, if the, if your customer isn't as, you know, sophisticated, kind of as, as Fabio was saying earlier, that like finance or insurance aid companies, they might not know all the details of um, satellite imagery and, and all the processing that goes into mosaics. And we'll have to explain how, well, you know, this isn't a single image. This is a collection of images over, um, you know, weeks, months, years. And uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about, like, why do we see this discontinuity in mosaics? I have a couple other examples of um, uh, th th that that issue is related to orthorectification accuracy. And I want to look at some other examples of that. Uh, and so here is an image from OpenStreetMap, and here I have a, a, a road, you know, a road network uh, with some satellite imagery underneath. And in this example, the imagery all, seems to align pretty well with my vectors, uh, with these roads that are extracted. And if I go to do, look at a different image, uh, you might see the whole road network is shifted from the image. And we get this a lot on the, like I said, the, in the public, you know, if you go to openstreetmap.org, you can do vector extraction and you can see Maxar imagery as uh, one of the base layers. And occasionally uh, mappers will find imagery like this and be like, well, that's weird. And they, they might, they would, if it's not somebody who's familiar with this problem, they might actually move the uh, the road network like vert, one vertex at a time and shift it over um, or the open street map tools have this imagery offset tool so you can you can actually shift the base layer underneath the the uh, road vectors and then get the things to align and in this case uh, by that's just doing a global shift uh, a translation and in this case I can make the imagery um, overlap my road network. But there's other cases where um, here, this is an example in the Himalayas, uh, and I'm showing two different base layers, but the same road network. And um, if I try that uh, imagery offset trick, it doesn't quite work. So like, I can make the image look better aligned you know, here on the bottom part of the uh, vector, but then this this switch back here, the road, I can't get it to line up. Um, and look at this, I, I did a 38 meter offset of my base layer. I mean, that's pretty egregious. Uh, and then even then, even if I could do that global shift, well, which one's right? Is it the image on the left is correct or uh, wrong? So I need to update the vectors on the right. So it's shown by these pink arrows. Or is it the other way? Should I, um, is the image on the right wrong? And should I leave the vectors as they're uh, drawn on the left imagery? Uh, are both images wrong? Like, why is this? And what can an image provider like Maxar do? And like, what, what should maybe a, a user of imagery be aware of? And I like this example I have here because there's, there's kind of a hint um, as to what's going on, um, and if you look, if you look here, here's the, here's the hint. The image looks like really smeared on the right, and even on the left uh, in this corner here, it's also really smeared. So I'm going to talk about like why does that image, why is that imagery so smeared, and um, what's going on, and it has to do with. Um, sources of error due to orthorectification. And so I have this little cartoon here uh, to demo, to talk about or introduce orthorectification. Um, 
I'm sure many of you in this class are probably, like I said, experts in this field, but just a quick review. Uh, this, the satellite imaging overhead, it has a, it has like an image plane. So it, it just takes a, a picture, you know, um, like I said, it's it really, it's a push broom. Uh, so it's, it's like a series of rows of data, but let's just think of it now as, you know, taking a single like rectangular image. Um, so you, we can index into that, that image with pixel coordinates. So you have like, a, uh, X and Y coordinates and ortho rectification is the process of taking that image from the perspective of the satellite and then mapping it to coordinates on the ground. So, um, longitude, latitude, and height. And if you are used to looking at data from like Landsat or Sentinel, um, those image, imaging systems are often just pointed uh, straight down as I have to depicted here in this graphic. Uh, and as part of ortho rectification, we have to, you know, intersect with, with a den. So, um, with Landsat and Sentinel that are just pointing straight down and you get an image and you, you can figure out its, uh, coordinates pretty well, given, uh, a course. DEM or digital elevation model. But, uh, I, Fabio and I were saying earlier that our, our satellites are really agile. And I mean, the first time I heard that, I was like, agile, what is it? You know? Yeah, they move quick. Okay. But, uh, what I mean, when I say they're agile, I mean, they have a lot of pointing agility. So as the satellite is flying overhead, um, it has, uh, gyroscopes on the on the satellite that can point the, um, the, the aperture, the, the lens of our, our imaging system to, um, a variety of places, uh, very quickly. And you might want to do this because it allows you to, uh, image different parts of, of earth using like one satellite. Um, so, you know, here is a, the satellites flying over North America on a single pass, um, we can image, um, anywhere within, you know, almost like the Eastern half of, uh, the United States at this point in time. Um, but there's downsides to, uh, so there's the, as, as we increase our, our off nadir angle and point to, um, you know, uh, off to the side, we can increase the area that we could collect an image, but then, um, we, it's possible to degrade accuracy. Um, so it's, it's really, like I said, going back to, it's a set of engineering trade-offs of having an agile constellation, but, um, I'm going to look at an example of this, uh, over Mount Fuji. And so here we're looking at an ortho image of the tallest volcano in Japan. Um, and yeah, you can see it with all the snow there and a little, uh, a caldera at the top. Um, uh, but our at satellites are really agile and it's also possible for us to collect at extreme, uh, off nadir angles. And so this is Mount Fuji collected, uh, the satellite in this image is, is like three degrees above the horizon. So it's pointing, you know, almost horizontal. I've got a little cartoon here showing you this. So, um, the satellite orbits 600 kilometers above earth. And here the satellite is like, you know, far out over the Pacific ocean and then aiming at Mount Fuji. Um, I stole this slide from Fabio while he was <laughs> presenting because, uh, so in that Mount Fuji example, um, we're increasing the off nadir angle. So we're, we're pointing, you know, instead of pointing straight down, we're kind of pointing off to the side and then that's going to degrade our, um, resolution. Uh, I like this, this slide as a way to, to demonstrate that. Um, so it's a trade off. We're getting worse resolution, but I mean, it, it makes pretty compelling images. You know, we're almost, we're like almost looking along the top of this giant cloud bank. And then, you know, over here is across, uh, into China, uh, these, this mountain range, um, it said really compelling images, but let's take a look at, as we increase the off nadir angle, what happens, uh, to our imagery. 
And if we have a perfect digital elevation model as part of this ortho rectification process, we do um, uh, these transformations of going from the from image space to the ground, and then we also go back from like the ground back to the image. Um, ortho rectification is is doing that mapping. And if you have a perfect digital elevation model, your um, geo referenced image, which I'm depicting here on the bottom, you'll get uh, your pixel location in just the right place with a perfect M. But in reality, our elevation models are not perfect. Uh, you might have an inaccurate DEM. Uh, you do have an inaccurate DEM, probably always. Uh, and in this case, is when we do this image to ground calculation, we think, and we do this ray trace, and we think that the elevation is here, and then it maps to our georeferenced image um, here. And what this, this spatial difference is what I'm saying is this accuracy de degradation or introducing error to the collect. Um, and so these digital elevation models are a major source of error in positional accuracy from our imagery. And you know, thinking back to the first part of my presentation showing that big cut line in the mosaic um, and how it's, you know, you're seeing what looks like a, a fault line of a, from an earthquake. Uh, it's really just that, you know, maybe um, the collection angle and the digital elevation model uh, had some error and positional inaccuracy. And let's take a look what happens to accuracy um, over the same, let's um, imagine that we're imaging the same spot on Earth, but with two different passes of the satellite um, at different off nadir angles. So here at a low off nadir angle, we go, you know, tra trace down to our perfect dam and figure out our ground truth location. If we increase the off nadir angle again, we have a perfect dim. Uh, we can uh, also get an accurate ground truth. But like I said, our dims are not perfect. Um, and so as we do this uh, ortho rectification, we, um, you know, with, with the lower off nadir, smaller off nadir angle, uh, we get our ground truth or our uh, geo referenced pixel. And with the large off nadir angle image, we do the same thing, and what you what you notice is, you know, even given the same digital elevation model, but increasing the off nadir angle, we're really degrading the accuracy a lot more in that case with the like big off nadir angle. So it's it, again, it's it's a set of trade offs with our agile constellation that, um, yeah, larger off nadir angle can give you more imaging opportunities on a single orbit, but then you can't always use it all the time because you you if your dem is not perfect you can have uh, lower positional accuracy and you know a lot of applications really depend on that accuracy uh, there's another type of uh, so yeah dem errors are one source of uh, accuracy uh, challenges and um, I'm going to talk about a second source of error, and that is that uh, for, as part of this ortho rectification, uh, we need precise uh, location and timing information of like where the satellite is, or where you know if you think of the satellite as a camera, ortho rectification needs to like map from that image plane down to the to the ground uh, accurately. So you need to know where your camera is, um, and and this is. For a satellite system, you need to know the orientation of the satellite, where is it pointing, and its trajectory. The trajectory is really important because, again, we're using a push broom sensor. And so as the imaging system flies overhead, its position is changing um, at a given trajectory. Um, and there's onboard hardware that helps determine the satellite position and trajectory. Uh, but these sensors aren't perfect. They also introduce error. And I have a little uh, example here from, I think this is from a uh, like a small drone, like a you could probably, you know, buy uh, commercially for a hundred bucks or something. Uh, so um, on the image on the left is showing the the two D image is collected by the drone, and then the image on the right is showing that 
that image projected onto a 3D space. Uh, and what you'll notice is that uh, these yellow bars are showing like where that that image projected onto a 3D space is inaccurate. Um, it's it's shifted, and this this part of this area where we're imaging is pretty flat. Uh, there's not a lot of terrain relief, yet we're still seeing these big offsets, these big inaccuracies, and the these are due these are due to um, imprecise like camera orientation. Uh, yes. Um, we are like in in ten minutes. We should go for lunch. I don't know how many slides are are missing yet, but if you want to leave some space for couple of questions perhaps just consider the timing yes yeah thanks Good. thanks um and i don't want to be the person no that's worse from that's lunch. worse than <laughs> coffee break <so>. that's, uh, <laughs> exactly yeah um so uh the uh, camera positioning we need to have nailed down uh, pretty accurate to minimize ortho rectification error um I'll skip this slide and in, in, in to save a little time. So I'm going to talk about like, so what do we do? Um, so one thing you could do is just collect on Nader imagery all the time, but it's kind of, it's a downside is you really limit where, you know, for every orbit, what you can image. Uh, so that's not great. Uh, so what can we do for the dem error? Uh, a lot of our products use a digital elevation model largely based on SRTM, this, uh, Shuttle Radar Topography Mission. It has 30 meter uh, postings. It was flown in the 1990s on a shuttle system. And it's, uh, there's, some, there's a better dem that we can use than that. And what, what Maxar does is we build a 3D model using fortuitous stereo pairs in our archive. Um, we remove uh, man-made features and uh, vegetation to get a bare earth model, and then use that as our digital elevation model. And it has uh, half meter postings versus 30 meter postings. So that really helps our uh, DEM uh, accuracy. And then as for adjusting the camera position, the attitude and ephemeris, we take that 3D model and we use our imagery to apply a 3D, uh, use the 3D model and apply a texture. And then that 3D model can be used to co-register new collects to that 3D model. And the 3D model is really accurate, uh, which means we can then pin down the accuracy of our image by updating the you know, camera position that is in the, our image metadata. So um, those two things can really improve our accuracy. And I'll talk about applications of this. This is similar to an image that Fabio showed earlier. So this is uh, imagery over Nigeria over a 10 year span. And when looking at this animations like this, um, I find it useful to keep your eyes tuned to a couple of like intersections, road intersections that shouldn't change. And what, what you'll notice is after we apply those the uh, geometry corrections I was I had mentioned, these road positions, these intersections are staying put. So if you had a semantic segmentation model that determines road center lines and your um, deep stack of images are really well aligned, then your segmentation model uh, will wind up with road center lines that are not moving around. If the, if the images were all bouncing around, then over time, you'd almost paint the whole image in roads, you know, if, if there's a couple meter shift between every collect. Um, and uh, shifting gears to another application, we're just gonna do a quick review of analysis ready data. So we have imagery that has um, cloud and cloud shadow masks, data masks. Uh, you can use those data masks to punch out clouds. Um, and then if you're, if you have a deep stack of images that are really well aligned. So here I'm showing a bunch of different collects with clouds. And if I have a data and cloud shadows, cloud and cloud shadow masks, I can punch out those clouds and stack the images on top of one another, and then get uh, a mosaic uh, of images that looks as if I took a single collect. 
And here I'm showing without the accuracy, uh, uh, without while using SRTM uh, based DEM, and you see the, the road center line like jumps here and there's like a break in the building. Um, but then if we do that co-registration and use a, a more accurate DEM, then um, the, the roads and buildings look like we think they should. And um, can, yeah, this isn't the way we build our large area mosaics, but this is just a like little toy problem that I made to kind of show the proof of concept that if your imagery is really well aligned, then it might simplify the way you build mosaics and then not have those breaks or discontinuities in the road. And so that's, the, that's, uh, that's all the content I have. Uh, yeah, I meant to leave more time for questions. <laughs> uh, so I will end it here and yeah, open the floor. Hi, Peter, my name is Alva. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was very nice. I just wanted to, to ask you about the atmospheric, con, um, atmospheric conditions of the mosaics. How do you manage them? And if you have a special algorithm that you use? Thank you. Uh, one one um, key technology, one of many key technologies, um, but dealing with atmospheric conditions is our satellite images, um, you know, they're, they're, they're the satellite is collecting the photons that come back to the satellite. So those photons have to pass like from the sun to earth through a bunch of atmosphere and then back through a bunch of atmosphere to, to the satellite. Um, and so the image, you know, is, is kind of like top of atmosphere, um, uh, is it, you're getting a lot of atmospheric effects from the image and converting that image first to, to a surface reflectance product is like critical. And so um, we have a, like a proprietary uh, atmospheric compensation algorithm that, uh, that Fabio was, uh, he, some of his slides had content on that. And th what that's trying to do is like remove the effects of the atmosphere so that we just start from surface reflectance. And if you have a good surface reflectance product that's accurate, it really simplifies um, color corrections to make the images look seamless across one another. Thank you. Um, my question was regarding this greeting, the GMRS or something like that, <laughs> the greeting system for tiling. Is this something uh, globally available? So for the whole earth, you provide these five kilometers tiles when you provide analysis ready data? It's, yeah, it's MGRS, the Military Grid Reference System is a, um, it's a global 10 kilometer grid. And um, what, what, what happens is in, I, don't, I have an image, but not convenient. <laughs> um, these grids are defined like per UTM zone. And so there'll be 60 of these grids um, and all the grids have overlap. Um, and so that, what that overlap, let's see, somewhere in here. Yeah, here, here I'm showing like the, the grid between two different UTM zones. And then you'll see here in the middle, the, these grids start to overlap. Um, and so it's, unfortunately, it's not a single global tiling scheme. It's uh, one, like one per UTM zone. And so there's 60 zones per, per hemisphere. Um, and they, yeah. The, I think on our website, we have like downloads of those 60 grids that you can use. Um, and then the, if you Google, yeah, MGRS, you'll find like downloads to, uh, like shape files or geo packages of the, those grids in this 10 kilometer, 10 kilometer spacing. 